It's great to be here, amen? Amen? amen. Come on, that was weak. Um, it's, it's great to be here as it is every Sunday to gather with God's people. Um, this Sunday, um, as if you were here for class, you know, we're continuing our series as we will for a while, for the, at least a few more weeks, um, probably several more weeks, maybe a month, maybe two months, who knows. Um, we're continuing our series on writing a mission statement, looking for developing a mission statement for our church. And last week we set before us two key questions for our church as we go through this process. Who are you? And what are you doing here? And these two questions, as we said last week, they're inextricably linked. They're two sides of the same coin. We can't know, who, we can't know what we're about until we know who we are. But vice versa, we can't, part of who we are is our mission, is our purpose. But that's a lot to talk about all at once. We need to keep those two questions in mind, but it's a lot to discuss all at once. So we're going to break it down a bit. Um, and while they are linked, identity, the question of identity, who we are, more naturally proceeds purpose. And so for the next few weeks in our sermons and classes, we're going to be talking about this aspect of identity. Who are we as the Cross Timbers Church of Christ? Now, again, as I'm going to say this every week, you obviously, I'll eventually stop, but the questions for, on the bulletin are for tonight, um, for small groups, and if you can't attend those. Um, if, you want, if you see a question, you read it, and you really like, think you have a good answer for it, write a note and give it, pass it along to the, one of our ministry leaders or me, because um, this is the way we're going to give input, our entire church is giving input into our mission statement. And I really encourage you, we sat, has, we've had some great discussions the past few weeks with the small groups, so I really encourage everyone to attend if possible. Um, it's a great time of fellowship and discussion. Um, but as you said last week, God is already at work. God is already accomplishing his mission in Stephenville, Texas. And we're called to go and join. And part of discerning where God is calling us, part of discerning where we're called to participate in God's mission is discerning our gifts, our skills, our resources. It's discerning and knowing our identity as cross timbers. And knowing who we are will necessarily will help us determine where God is calling us, where the ways in which God has uniquely equipped our congregation to serve his mission. And knowing in our identity will necessarily shape um, how we work in God's mission and serving God's kingdom. So to know our mission, to know our purpose, we must first know who we are. And part of knowing who we are, part of knowing our identity is knowing our history, our story. It's been said, and I'm not sure who the original author of the quote is, I found many, many different versions. Um, and the version I've remembered is, you have to know where you come from to know where you are going. You have to know where you come from to know where you are going. And this quote rings true. Knowing where you come from, knowing your history, knowing your story is essential. For stories are powerful. And knowing our story, our story necessarily shapes how we live, relate, and act in the world. Uh, for example, that I'm from Texas, but I spent some time in exile in New Jersey, um, is necessarily going to shape how I relate and live and interact with people when I come back to Texas. Our stories shape us. In many ways, our stories define us. They're a significant part of who we are. And yet the fact that story is part of our identity is not the full story, pun not intended. Um, but stories can shape us, but regardless of how positive or negative the story is, stories can shape us in different ways. It can shape us for good or for evil. And again, regardless of how positive or negative our st story itself is, um, the story shapes us. But we have some agency in how that story shapes us. And what is true of individuals is also true of communities. So the story we tell here, the story we tell here at the Cross Timbers Church of Christ, the story we tell of ourselves can be a weight holding us back, or it can be a powerful unifier and motivation for us going forward. And we, as you said, stories are powerful, and how we relate to tell and share and pass on our story can have great impact upon our present and our future. It can help us know our purpose and our mission. It can help us know where we're going. 
And so the question for us this morning is, how do we embrace, how do we take ownership of the story of Cross Timbers? How do we use our story, he, the story of the church here as a unifying tool and motivation for us going forward? Now luckily, God thought stories were important as well. God thought stories were important, and he thought stories were so powerful that they could unite and in many ways save his people. Thought, God thought stories were so powerful and so important that he commanded the story to be told, as we're going to see this morning. And the custom and the Jewish custom and practice that comes out of the command we're going to look at this morning will give us some ideas, help us take ownership of our story as cross timbers. Um, now, our text this morning comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. Now, if you remember last week, um, in our, our key text for identity was the opening lines from Moses' giving of the law to Israel in Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Moses gives this statement of identity to Israel that became this unifying statement for the people of God. And then, as we're, the verse we're going to look at this morning, down in 20 through 24, are, is a primary command. Chapter 6 is really Moses' introduction to his speech. And this primary command we're going to look at, in, starting in verse 20 this morning, tells us something of the function of Deuteronomy. So let's read our text this morning. Deuteronomy 6, starting in verse 20. Give ear to the word of God. When your child asks you in time to come, saying... What are these testimonies and the statutes and judgments mean which the Lord your God commanded you? Then you shall say to your child, We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us from Egypt with a mighty hand. Moreover, the Lord showed great distressing signs and wonders before our eyes against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all his household. He brought us up from there in order to bring us into and give us the land which he had sworn to our fathers. So the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord, Lord our God, for our good always, and for our survival as it is today. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe this commandment before the Lord our God, just as he commanded us. So the command here in verse 20 to teach one's children, it's especially important in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, not only is signified by its position here at the beginning of Moses' speech, but it's the most common refrain throughout the book of Deuteronomy and Exodus. Teach your children. Teach your children. So, obviously, teaching one's children, past, teaching one's children is important for God's people's religious life and their identity. But we must pay careful attention to the content of the teaching. We can't pass over this too quickly. Look at verses 20 and 21 again. It says, when your child asks you in times to come, saying, what do these statues and judgments mean? You shall say to your child, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us up with a mighty hand. Now this is interesting. It's kind of odd. In a book whose title means second law, and given the wording of the question itself, what do these statues, judgments, testimonies mean? We would think that the content of the answer would be a list of rules, regulations, guidelines. But it isn't. Instead of teaching the children all the specifics and a list of rules that the, the Jewish people must follow, God commands them to tell a story. To tell specifically their story. We were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord rescued us. In a book full of laws, that this is the command that God tells his people to teach their children. This, this is the primary thing God is concerned that the children and future generations of his people learn. It tells us that God is less concerned that our children, that our people know all the particular regulations and practices that we follow. God is less concerned that we know all these list of rules and regulations. Whether God is concerned that the children know their story, that they know their history. God is concerned that the children know their story, they know why they practice the rules and regulations in the first place. God wants his people to know their history, to know their story, to know their identity. God's concern is that his people know who they are. That they know that they are, in fact, God's people. So how did God's people fulfill this command? 
How did they teach their children? How did they allow each generation to tell and take ownership of the story? The command and the similar commands from this one found in Exodus and Deuteronomy um, all center around the event of the Exodus and Passover. Now, um, the Passover and the Exodus is the key formation of the Jewish people. This is the main event in Jewish history. This is really what marks the beginning of Israel as a nation. And in order to fulfill this command to pass on to tell their story, Jews, the, Jews, the Jewish people develop customs around this Passover celebration. Now we're probably most familiar with Passover through the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, which becomes the Lord's Supper. Um, Jesus' Last Supper was a Passover meal. And long before the time of Jesus, following the commands in Exodus, the Jewish people developed certain traditions and practices around this meal. It says that Passover, the Exodus, is the paramount event in Jewish history. And really, in reality, it's really where the Jewish people become a nation. It's where God begins his covenant with them. In many ways, it's where they receive their identity. And so at the Feast of Passover, commemorating the events of the Exodus, the Jewish people develop these customs and practices centering around a meal. And these customs help them recall and retell the story. <laughs> Now, this is done primarily through what is known as the Haggadah, uh, which in Hebrew means the telling. Um, this is a spoken liturgy set around every meal at Passover. And in the Haggadah, sometime before the time of Jesus, so Jesus would have practiced this as well, the Jews thought it important to include a section that fulfills this command from our text this morning in Deuteronomy. It fulfills the command to teach one's children to pass on the story. Um, so every year at Passover, um, the family are sitting at the meal, and the youngest child at the table asks four questions. Now, I've been told you all have gone through a Passover liturgy before. Is that correct? Um, do you remember the four questions? The youngest child asks four questions. Um, one, of the, one of the questions is the one we read this morning. There's some other ones throughout Exodus and Deuteronomy. Um, the youngest child asks four questions, and the head of the household answers the four questions with the story of God's people. And even today, excuse me, and even today when Jews begin their Passover, practice this Passover celebration, when Jews celebrate Passover today, the story begins the same. When we were slaves in Egypt. When we were slaves in Egypt. Not when they were slaves. Not when our ancestors were slaves. Not when some people a long time ago were slaves. When we were slaves in Egypt. And they retell the story of God's saving acts as if they were there. And what they are doing in this, what they are doing by saying when we were slaves, is they're taking ownership of their story. They're taking ownership of their identity. The early rabbis commanded that in every generation, one is obligated to see, himse to see himself as though he too came out from Egypt. Now, the point here, of course, is not that every person must experience slavery, but that the, the idea is that the Exodus, the Passover, is so central to the Jewish identity, is so central to the Jewish life and mission, that every generation must be able to know and tell the story, to know and share the story of God, their slavery and God's redeeming act. It's, they must be able to pass on to tell the story so that they cannot possibly think of themselves and their own identity without thinking of the generations of faithful Jews that had gone before them. That they can't speak of who they are and speak of their identity, that part of who they are now depended upon the faithfulness of God's people in the past. And then also that who they are now will affect future generations of God's people to come. And the wisdom of the early rabbis, the wisdom of the Jewish people in this, is theirs is not an individual identity. It's collective. It's a communal identity. It calls people together. It unites people. It motivates people. It gives them a common story. You know, it's, it's a realization that part of their identity, part of who they are, comes from the people who had gone before. And that who they are now will affect future generations to come. The common story, the common, this common story of the Exodus gives them a common identity. And retelling that story year after year at Passover 
allows the Jewish people to take ownership of that identity, to own their story, to embrace their often difficult past. It helps them create and form their community. It gives continuity to their people throughout time. And enables them to belong and to participate in this shared identity. But remember, telling the story is not all. As we said at the beginning, story, stories can affect us in two ways. It can be a weight holding us back or it can be help motivate us going forward. And the Jewish people telling the story of slavery and oppression, it could have affected them in two ways. It could have been a weight holding them down, help, forcing them to accept an identity as an oppressed people, forcing them to accept any oppression that came along. Or it could, as, it, as they in fact have done with this identity, it could unite them. It could enable them to survive some of the most horrific tragedies in human history. You know, some people, it's, it's a wonder how the Jewish people have survived so many atrocities. Stalin, Nazi Germany, white supremacy in America today with the synagogue bombings. But I think what, you, what gives the people this endurance, what gives the Jewish people the ability to survive these horrible atrocities, is that they know who they are. They know their story. And they tell their story as a story of God's victory and deliverance of God's faithfulness to his people. God in the Exodus had already given the Jewish people everything they needed to take ownership, to own their story, to embrace their identity. And as is clear from the last verses of our text this morning, part of taking ownership of that story is being obedient to God who made the story of redemption and victory possible. And so this morning, we as cross timbers, as we seek to take ownership of our story, to take ownership of our identity, God's command comes to us. He says, tell your story. Tell it to each other. Tell it to your children. Who are we? What makes us the cross timbers church of Christ? What story do we teach our children? Better question, what story do our children learn by watching us? How does our story define us? How does our story shape us? How does our story tell us how we fit into God's kingdom? And then finally, how do we take ownership of that story? How do we use the story of cross timbers and tell them in such a way that we're not weighed down by the hardships and troubles of the past? How do we tell the story in such a way that it unites us and it motiv motivates us as we go forward? How do we not let the pains and troubles of the church's past weigh us down in the future? And how does our story inform how we should approach our future and our mission? And so this morning, let's take ownership of our story. Let's tell our story together. <clears throat> when God called us together and we began meeting in 1987 in the front of a store, Let's tell our story together as we stand and sing.